and seven minutes later. So. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. My name is Matt Abbott, and I'm the Director of Government and Diplomatic Programs here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. I'd like to welcome Jamie Fly and Laura Rosenberger to our platform. We're honored to have you here in Chicago. Please note that we are on the record and live streaming today's program. Please make sure to silence your phones, and we will be taking audience questions later after our speaker's remarks. For those of you joining us by live stream, you can submit your questions online by typing chi.cnf.io into your phone's browser. For nearly a century, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has provided an independent, nonpartisan platform for a variety of different perspectives to promote deeper global understanding and active U.S. engagement in the world. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Before I turn it over to our speakers, I would like to introduce them to you. Jamie Fly is co-director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy and a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. He previously served on Senator Marco Rubio's staff and was executive director of the Foreign Policy Initiative. He did his undergraduate work at American University and received his master's degree from Georgetown University. Laura Rosenberger is co-director of the Alliance for Securing Democracy and a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. She previously worked as a foreign policy advisor for Hillary for America and has served in a range of positions at the State Department and the National Security Council. She did her undergraduate work at Penn State University and received her master's from American University. I will return later to moderate audience Q&A, but ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jamie Fly and Laura Rosenberger. Well, thank you, Matt, for that introduction. Thank you to the Chicago Council for hosting us today. It's really a privilege and pleasure to be here, and thanks to all of you um, for joining us for this conversation in the room, and, and for those who are joining us online, um, welcome. Um, really, really looking forward to the conversation today. Um, Jamie and I will give some opening remarks to frame the conversation, but also really look forward to um, answering questions and having a dialogue about some of um, these really important issues. Um, I think most Americans at this point um, are familiar with um, what has uh, what we have seen unfold in the wake of the 2016 U.S. presidential election in terms of Russia's um, efforts to interfere in those elections. Um, but as we have been looking at this challenge, we come at it from the national security perspective and understanding that this has been part of a transatlantic effort undertaken by Russia, trying to undermine democracies across the transatlantic space. And that it's also not just about elections, um, that we see real um, attacks on the pillars of democracy and elections being one piece of that. And the work we are doing um, at the Alliance for Securing Democracy is looking at how we can learn lessons from the European experiences that have been um, where, where countries have been subjected to these challenges, but also the measures they have taken to combat that, uh, but also um, the ways that we can work together um, to fortify our democracies from within. So let me talk a little bit first about sort of why Russia is doing this, um, why other actors may be seeking to um, follow in their wake, um, and some of the vulnerabilities that I think they're exploiting. Um, what, what we've seen, of course, is that over the better part of a decade, um, Putin has begun to test the waters of um, engaging in his periphery to undermine democracies um, from the Baltic states, um, where we've seen in 2007 really the beginning of cyber attacks on Estonia's um, electric grid, um, of course, the intervention in Georgia, um, the intervention in Ukraine, um, and then what we, I think, what took many analysts by surprise um, was the uh, use of these tactics against Western Europe in the Brexit uh, referendum, um, the elections in France and Germany last year, as well as in the U.S. 2016 presidential election. Um, the goal as we see it from Putin is essentially um, to weaken others in order to gain relative power. Russia is a declining power. We think Putin is acting out of weakness here. Um, but is, is really trying to weaken others in order to strengthen his own hand, which is really the only way that he can do that. Um, Putin is very much focused on his own power, um, and that's something we can return to later in terms of what that means for the measures that we can take in response. Um, but it also means um, that his, the toolkit that he uses, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, presents particular challenges for democracies because 
Um, Putin's willing to take a number of risks, um, acting, I kind of think about him as acting like a wounded animal, um, often the most dangerous because it has very little to lose, um, is acting out of, of fear and a position of weakness. Um, but, um, I, you know, one of the things that we see is that Putin is looking to ways to identify and exploit vulnerabilities in our own societies. And so when we talk in a minute about some of the tools and tactics that are being used um, to undermine our democracy, um, the reality is that uh, Putin may be exploiting some of these vulnerabilities, but these are vulnerabilities in our own democracy, in many cases that are of our own creation. And so I think it's really important as we think about this challenge to think about democracy as a, as a national security issue, which is sort of how we're approaching this challenge. Um, the last point I'd make on sort of the broad geostrategic way that we, we look at this challenge um, is that Russia is sort of on the front lines of, of this in the United States and Europe. Um, but in the Asia Pacific and actually increasingly in the European space, um, there is a lot of concern about the way in which Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party is also adopting its own um, approach to interfering in democracies um, and undermining, um, undermining their institutions as well. Um, and that's something that we think is a sort of over the horizon challenge, but one that we should also be very mindful of in terms of ensuring that we are protecting our democracy against future threats. So I'll um, talk a little bit about uh, just how we got to this point uh, with the Russia case and then also um, some of the vulnerabilities that Laura referenced that the Russians are currently exploiting that we're trying to highlight and identify so that future authoritarian actors, especially the Chinese or others, who want to try to undermine democracy um, will, will find it much more difficult, at least in the US case. As Laura noted, uh, we, we assess that Putin's operating from a position of weakness. Um, that doesn't mean we can dis just disregard that threat. I think part of our concern and the reason we're doing this as a bipartisan project is we feel that both Republicans and Democrats for far too long have not taken the Russia challenge seriously. Uh, some of this just goes back obviously to the end of the Cold War and the sort of Fukuyama argument about the end of history that we thought that over time Russia you know, sometimes make the same assessment about China will move in our direction, will democratize through uh, our economic and diplomatic engagement with them. Multiple administrations tried that approach. Uh, certainly I served in the George W. Bush administration. Uh, you know, President Bush at the time tried to work with the Russians on arms control. He tried to engage uh, with Putin on a number of issues, felt that he had uh, reached a level of understanding, but then by the end of the Bush administration, you saw Russia's invasion of Georgia uh, in the summer of 2008. Following that, you had the Obama administration, which tried its own uh, so-called reset with Russia, again, trying to carve out areas of cooperation. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, you uh, saw Russia annex Crimea, basically invade uh, eastern Ukraine and, and fuel a, a war uh, in Europe for the first time in, in decades. Uh, so this is a bipartisan uh, series of failures in terms of broader Russia policy that led to this point where Putin and the Russian regime felt that they could go to such lengths as to interfere directly uh, in our democracy. And it's a bipartisan failure to listen to our partners and allies in Europe who were really on the front lines of this type of aggression, who were experiencing this political manipulation and interference firsthand. I think, uh, again, Republican and Democratic administrations did not take that challenge as seriously as they should have and did not see the warning signs uh, about where it could lead in terms of an eventual threat to our own democracy. So what are the vulnerabilities uh, that the Russians are exploiting uh, in all democracies, but especially in the US case? And I'm de identifying some of these actually based on comparisons that we've done as we've looked at some of our European partners. Because it's interesting, although as transatlantic democracies we share values, we have similar systems in many cases, there are major cultural differences obviously between us and many individual European countries. And some of those cultural differences uh, actually uh, play in the favor of certain types of defenses against these types of attacks, um, and others make us more vulnerable. Some of the challenges I think we're facing in the US right now are just the pure partisanship uh, that we see in our country. Uh, when we talk in a little bit about some specific examples of the engagement on social media that we've seen with Russian affiliated accounts, a lot of it is just hitting Americans against each other, exacerbating divides that already exist. Uh, obviously, it's not very difficult in almost any on uh, debate about almost any political issue to get two Americans arguing with each other about something. Uh, 
uh, and that's a vulnerability that uh, we've seen the, the Russians certainly exploit. Uh, another vulnerability is just the, uh, the frustration and uh, kind of distance, I think, that between many Americans and their government. Uh, if you just look at polling, there's a, a lot of discontent uh, with government, you see it in the approval rating of Congress, which I think has been consistently in single, uh, single digits for the last several cycles. Many Americans have already decided that government is hopeless, doesn't serve their purposes, uh, doesn't benefit them, and so it's very easy to take advantage of that in terms of certain messaging that you can push into uh, um, American culture. Another vulnerability uh, that's more U.S. specific, uh, especially if you compare it to some Western European countries, is our media culture, our changing media culture. Um, there's really been a significant decline of traditional media as the primary source of news and information. Uh, by some accounts in certain polls, as many as 60 percent of Americans cite social media now as their primary source of news and information. That is not uh, that is not the case in most European countries. Uh, many of the Western European countries still have very resilient, strong traditional media outlets. Some of them are publicly funded. Uh, Germany, for instance, most Germans still get their news from either TV, radio, newspapers. Social media use uh, occurs, but it's within certain segments of society. And even those who use social media don't use it primarily for news and information. And so that's one major vulnerability that we found uh, that the Russians in particular have exploited. Uh, another one is just the uh, organization of our government. And this is something that I think got lo both Laura and myself interested in this uh, project because sitting on different sides of Pen uh, different ends of Pennsylvania Avenue in this latest case, Laura was working in the Obama administration uh, in the early days of Russia's intervention in Ukraine. I was working for Senator Rubio in the Senate. I think we both saw how the U.S. government was not structured appropriately to deal with this challenge. Uh, it's the sort of threat that uh, involves multiple agencies uh, and crosses the territory of multiple agencies. Uh, it involves things like social media, which uh, traditional government agencies often don't understand or uh, know how to deal with or even know what many of the platforms are. Uh, and it's a mix of homeland security challenges with traditional national security. And so you have these divisions within the U.S. government and seams where uh, tackling this effectively falls within those seams. And I think uh, in the 2016 case, that was one problem uh, that uh, manifests itself pretty uh, quickly that the Russians were able to exploit. And then two final things on the cyber, on the broader cyber uh, front, which Laura will talk about in a minute, on cyber hacking. Cybersecurity is a general problem which the U.S. government has not grappled effectively with uh, across the board. And so it's, you know, we've just seen that in the multiple breaches of Americans' personal uh, information, hacks of U.S. government agencies. Um, so that's another area of concern. And then on the financial front, uh, which Laura will get into in a minute, uh, that's another area where criminals have exploited uh, uh, lax enforcement of existing U.S. laws, loopholes in uh, in laws like the Foreign uh, Agents Registration Act uh, in the U.S. Um, that have not been fully enforced. And so our, our regulatory and legal structure in many of these key areas that are targeted by these sorts of tactics uh, have not been updated and modernized in some time. So I'll turn it back to Laura to talk a little bit in more detail about the toolkit that Russia and other authoritarians use. So Jamie laid out very well the vulnerabilities that are, you know, able to be exploited, but how, how are those being exploited? Well, um, I'm sure, quite sure that a lot of people in this room are familiar with some of the, the big headlines that we see all the time, but sometimes I think it's easy to forget the sort of entirety of, of actually what we know, both from the U.S. intelligence community's assessment, um, some of the indictments that Special Counsel Mueller has passed down, um, as well as some of the really interesting and, and very good um, investigations that have been, been done by um, some news outlets, um, in particular the exploitation of social media. Um, so let's let's start with cyber um, in particular, which, as Jamie noted, uh, ha has continued to pose policy challenges for the U.S. government, given how much of it actually falls into the private sector um, in, in terms of who actually owns the systems. And in this case, it's not just the private sector, it was also state and uh, local election um, administration officials, um, as well as campaigns. So we saw in the 2016 election um, 
the hacks on the DNC, um, on, on John Podesta's email, um, who was Hillary's campaign chair. Um, but we also saw probes of at least uh, 21, if not 39, and the number remains disputed, and we can come back to this later about why this is a problem, um, probes on state election systems. And people often think about that in the context of um, the actual voting machines. But some of that actually was probes on the election rolls. Um, and if you think about this, when you show up to vote, I actually don't know the specific um, laws in in uh, Illinois, but you know, in many places you have to show your um, your address or your you know driver's license or you know some kind of voter registration card or at least give your full name. Um, and my middle initial is M, standing for Michelle. Um, if somebody were to hack into a state election um, role and change my middle name to Nicole. And I show up and I present myself as Laura Michelle Rosenberger, um, and they have Laura Nicole Rosenberger on their list. Um, in most states, at best, I would need to file a uh, provisional ballot, which would be subject to challenge. Um, in some states, I might not be able to cast a vote at all. Um, so we're not just talking about vulnerabilities in the actual um, vote machines, um, but also in the, in the election rolls. Um, there are other parts of the election infrastructure that were also probed in 2016 um, that could be vulnerable to some kind of manipulation. Um, in 2016, as far as we know, nothing was actually changed, and I think that's important to bear in mind. But it's also important to bear in mind that in many cases in a democracy, um, all you need to do is instill doubt in the integrity of these institutions, and, and that is something that Jamie and I are, are deeply worried about as we head into upcoming elections, um, is making sure that people have faith um, in the integrity of the voting systems. Um, and so part of what may have been happening in 2016 by the, um, by the probes that have been attributed to Russian link hacking networks on the state election systems may have been trying to figure out how they could actually eventually get in there and change things, but may have also just been preparing to be able to sow doubt um, if they chose to do so. Um, we also know that um, the, the Russian um, now well-known um, Internet Research Agency, um, which is often referred to as the St. Petersburg Troll Farm, um, undertook a sophisticated information operations campaign um, using fake personas, fake accounts um, that were created online, masquerading as Americans. Um, this was, in fact, combined um, in some instances with um, the material that was stolen in some of those cyber attacks. Um, so from the DNC hack, from, from John Podesta's email, right, you saw um, the leaking of that information through WikiLeaks, which the intelligence community has set as a proxy for um, Russian intelligence. Um, but then you also saw these um, bot and troll accounts on social media, um, these sort of fake accounts that have been created and can amplify um, and manipulate the social media environment. Uh, really trying to push that um, hacked material. Um, and we also now know that at least some of that material that was released, um, that was supposedly from those, um, from those stolen email accounts, was actually manipulated before it was released, right? So these were documents purporting to be from one or another of these hacks, um, but in some cases they were actually um, changed and manipulated in some ways before they were released to the public. Um, it's another dimension of the information operations. And Jamie, in a minute, is going to talk a little bit more about how um, the social media aspect of this plays out in particular. Um, the financial space is another area where we have seen um, the use of money laundering, illicit finance, um, and other kinds of um, sort of moving dark money around um, to be able to support whether it's political groups, candidates, um, or um, parties. And this is something that we have seen um, in a number of places in the European context. Um, I think there is still a lot of questions um, at this point um, about whether or not there was anything like that that happened in the United States or is happening in the United States. Um, there have been press reports about um, investigations into funding of certain political groups um, by uh, Russian um, sort of very Putin crony um, individuals. Um, but we haven't sort of seen any proven evidence of that at this point. But I think, you know, again, trying to learn from the European examples to understand what might be um, going on here and make sure we're fully investigating that is kind of the way we're, we're thinking about this. Um, 
In the European context, we also see um, the use of sort of coercion at the strategic economic level. This manifests in particular when it comes to energy coercion. So the Russian government has been pretty sophisticated in its use of using um, its energy resources, um, gas pipelines, oil pipelines, um, and those kinds of deals um, to be able to, um, it, what one colleague has named sort of capture um, the, the local um, economy and their pol therefore the political context um, to be able to sort of manipulate the decision making. In some cases this has involved um, recruiting former senior political officials to the boards of state affiliated companies. So um, one of the best known examples of this is former German Chancellor um, Schroeder, um, who is now on the board of Rosneft, which is um, the largest um, Russian state owned oil company. Um, and and basically, you know, acting very closely, therefore, um, in the interest of the Kremlin. Um, so you have a former ger former German leader, basically on the on the Kremlin payroll, um, <laughs> to not mince words about it. Um, and and then we've seen um, support for extremist groups in a number of different ways. Again, mostly in the European context, but. Um, thinking about how this could manifest itself as we see an increasingly polarized United States. Um, you know, so in in the European case, we've seen, um, this is gonna sound crazy when I say it, but um, the establishment of things called fight clubs, um, which are training camps run by former Russian military and intelligence officials, where they bring in um, sort of extremist individuals for training in paramilitary activity. Um, we've seen this in, uh, in Scandinavian countries, Germany, um, and there's been some um, actual video footage that's recently come out about some of these training camps in the Balkans, um, in some of the more um, uh, unstable parts of the, of the continent, which is, I think, of particular concern to us. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the toolkit. Um, just two other brief comments on this that I would say. One is um, when we think about, I mentioned China earlier, when we think about how China m is playing in this space, um, they often sort of use some of those same tools but in a very different kind of way. Um, and so I think um, when we are doing some of the work that we're trying to think about looking forward, how these threats manifest in the future, we're very concerned about um, acquisition of high-end technology like um, artificial intelligence tools combined with um, sophisticated um, data tools. Um, so uh, a lot of Chinese link companies have been acquiring large amounts of data um, on you know, individuals around the world, um, including on their own citizens, where they've now created a social ranking system um, for every Chinese citizen. But if you think about how that could be used to manipulate and undermine democratic institutions um, using cyber technology and, and information platforms, um, you can envision a scenario that could be you know, quite troubling in, e in an even more sophisticated way and per potentially less detectable but more destructive way um, than what the Russians have done. Um, and the last point that I would make is on some of these tools, um, what makes them so hard to combat, um, and we'll come back to sort of our, our recommendations of what we do about it in a minute, but a lot of these tools are actually under, you know, using our strengths against us. So our open information environment, our, you know, our First Amendment free speech, which is you know absolutely fundamental to our democracy. Um, these incredible technologies that we have created um, that have allowed for so much innovation and in some parts of the world have been a democratizing force. And our adversaries have basically identified how to take these tools and take our, our open and free society and turn it against us. Um, and, and that poses a particular challenge in how you are able to combat it because you don't want to basically throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? These are our strengths and, and that's what makes our democracy um, so, so thriving. Um, but at the same time, we need to make sure that they aren't able to be used against us. So come back to that in a minute. So I'm gonna uh, quickly run through a brief case study of uh, one of our initial tools, of some lessons learned from one of our initial tools. We, uh, but we believe that one of the, the best ways to respond to this challenge is to shine a light on it on some of these uh, threats and to just raise awareness because if you have informed citizenry, it's uh, much more likely that they may not actually respond uh, if, if certain messages are pushed or certain influence attempts are made. 
One way we're doing that is through a social media, a Twitter dashboard we call Hamilton 68, uh, which is named after uh, Federalist 68, in which Hamilton warned about the potential impact of foreign interference on our democracy. We also have a German uh, language version, Article 38, but I'll talk uh, mainly uh, in the next few minutes about what we've found over the last number of months monitoring uh, this dashboard. The dashboard looks at roughly 600 uh, accounts, which our experts have followed for uh, a number of years and watched the activities of these accounts on Twitter. Uh, we have a, a relatively high degree of confidence that they are Russian linked. Uh, we're not saying that they are controlled directly by the Kremlin, but these are accounts that are pushing out on a constant basis messaging that is aimed uh, to influence, and these, this network is primarily aimed at an American uh, audience. So a couple, uh, and I'll race through most of these, but uh, a couple of points to highlight. Uh, this is an ongoing problem. A lot of Americans, I think, even if they engage in conversation about the notion that Russia might have interfered in 2016, they somehow think it was tied specifically to an election and specifically to voting. Uh, the thing that we're seeing, this, uh, this dashboard is up on the web. Uh, anyone can go look at it. Uh, these messages are being pushed into our domestic debates on an ongoing basis. Here's one perfect example from last September. If you all recall, uh, there was a mini political controversy about whether NFL players needed to stand uh, during the national anthem. Uh, we even saw accounts pushing certain messaging on different sides of that issue in response to when President Trump uh, weighed in. So uh, just a perfect example of the sorts of issues that uh, these accounts engage on um, and, and the fact that it's uh, something that's still going on. Uh, slides not changing. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. So the other um, thing I want to highlight is you saw in that case with the NFL that uh, it was a very domestic political issue. Um, what we see is that it's not that they have abandoned any hope of influencing Americans on foreign policy. We see a mix often of foreign policy topics that suit Russia's interests as well as domestic political issues. And here's one example from last November when uh, you can see clearly in the top hashtags that were being pushed by this network of 600 accounts, uh, you see issues like Syria and Ukraine, uh, Donbass, White Helmets referring to the Syrian uh, civil defense group that rescues uh, uh, civilians from the rubble in Syria, uh, mixed in with Pocahontas. Well, what does Pocahontas refer to? Uh, this was right around the time when President Trump uh, referred to Senator Elizabeth Warren by this nickname Pocahontas, and so you see the mix. Now, sometimes uh, it's hard to directly assess the purpose of certain hashtags or articles that are being pushed by these networks. Sometimes I think it's uh, to amplify a certain view, uh, especially a fringe view on the left or right. Other times uh, you can see in the aftermath of a natural disaster or some sort of crisis, the use of trending hashtags to maybe attract more followers. So once you get uh, a number of Americans to follow your account, then down the road if you want to try to influence on a particular topic uh, that may be unrelated to what the initial uh, hashtag was uh, pushing, you then have more followers who are uh, listening to you. Um, this more recently is a, a more traditional example of the types of uh, issues that are engaged on. We've seen a lot of activity on this network in the last several weeks on both the poisoning of the former Russian spy in the UK, Scripple, and there's been a lot of documentation, not just by us, but many other researchers about all the different narratives that the Russian government has been putting out, not just through channels like this, but also through its own overt foreign ministry spokespeople, uh, through uh, Russia Today, Sputnik, uh, its news outlets pushing conspiracy theories and different alternative explanations of who could have been behind the poisoning. Uh, we've also seen in the wake of the US, French, and UK strikes in response to chemical weapons use in Syria, a lot of similar um, uh, activity on social media pushing certain narratives uh, uh, you know, that are favorable towards Russia. Um, this is an example of how, uh, again, many Americans, I think, even if they think that there's been Russian interference, they think that maybe it's on one side or the other, one side of the political divide. Uh, there's actually a lot, if you look at uh, the activity on the accounts that we follow, it's basically e equal opportunity over time. You'll see Democrats' uh, stories hitting Democrats being pushed, 
stories hitting Republicans being pushed, even Trump administration officials get attacked through uh, these social media accounts. This is one snapshot from last September when Senator McCain uh, voted against the Graham-Cassidy uh, health care bill. Uh, you saw a lot of anti-McCain activity. We've seen, it's not just Senator McCain, pretty much every major Republican thinker in Congress, uh, Speaker Ryan, Leader McConnell, they've all been attacked uh, by these accounts at one time or another. I'll, I'll go through this quickly. This is another example on the other side of pushing uh, conspiracy theories related to Clinton-Russia uh, collusion, just to show uh, the equal opportunity point. This is another political example. If you remember the release the memo uh, controversy from earlier this year, this was when the House Republicans were trying to force the release of memos related to the Russia investigation. Uh, it's another uh, example of uh, politi political activity. Um, this is an ex interesting example of how they often use the same messaging to target either side. Now, this uh, was not on our dashboard, but was on another platform called Reddit, which just in recent weeks uh, announced that they were deactivating a number of accounts that they had determined were linked to the Internet Research Agency, which is that entity, the St. Petersburg troll farm that Laura mentioned that was, uh, that was highlighted in the Mueller indictment. And uh, these, are, uh, these are memes that basically ran in the run-up to 2016, and they basically showed the same uh, slogans being used to target uh, Secretary Clinton and then also to target uh, now President Trump. So they were appealing to both sides, basically using a version of the same uh, message with just different photos. Uh, another example of uh, basically racist message being pushed uh, and then uh, kind of an anti-racism message being pushed. Again, this is from that same group of IRA-linked accounts on uh, Reddit. And this is very common. Uh, you've seen, you basically see them play both sides. In the Senate Intelligence Committee hearings, they actually highlighted, uh, and the Mueller indictment highlighted this as well, they went so far as to create fake groups on some of these social media platforms targeting different segments. So you had uh, groups aimed at American Muslim community, um, basically a place for American Muslims to go who were politically engaged and to talk to each other. And then, uh, for instance, in a, a chat room or group that was for people who supported the secession of Texas. And they actually, in one case in Houston, I uh, organized competing rallies from both of those groups at, on the same day and the same time in Houston, and they successfully got uh, hundreds of Americans to show up in person at rallies in the same place in Houston who were there with very different purposes, and they were hoping to foment violence. Uh, luckily, there were police there that prevented that. Uh, this is another similar dynamic on uh, the issue of immigration basically uh, a, a semi kind of pro-immigrant message with an anti-immigrant message, again, being pushed by those same accounts. Um, and then here at the end, just have a few examples of more traditional foreign policy. There's a lot of evidence and there's been reporting on uh, activity related to the Catalonia independence referendum in Spain um, that was being pushed out through networks outside of Spain. Uh, and we've also seen that dynamic where certain uh, Russian engagement, say, in the French presidential election. We have President Macron in Washington today. Uh, there was an effort in the final hours of that election to try to uh, do a document dump of supposedly hacked information because of a media blackout in French politics. They actually res they turned to uh, social media actors, especially on the alt-right here in the U.S., to try to get information projected from social media in the U.S. back into the French debate uh, in the final hours that in an effort to prevent Macron uh, and then uh, a final example of another traditional foreign policy topic. This was in recent years we had a debate about letting Montenegro into NATO, and this was another Reddit uh, example of this message being uh, sent to American voters that basically you've spent too much money supporting countries like Montenegro. It's basically a waste. You could spend that money at home, and obviously that's a much more traditional foreign policy goal of Russia is to get the U.S. out of its near abroad uh, and to be less focused on some of these allied concerns. So I'll turn it back to Laura to answer the easy question now of what do we do about all of this? <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Um, 
I, just to tease out a couple of sort of highlights to link back to where I started as well about sort of what is Russia's strategy in all of this, um, from what I think we've seen illustrated in, in the examples that Jamie showed. One is that the goal is sort of chaos and exploiting division and trying to weaken us, right? This is not at the end of the day, and I say this as a Democrat, this is not about trying to help Republicans, this is not about trying to favor some political party, um, and really it's in a way not, I believe, trying to achieve some policy goals um, in the long run. This is really just about how can um, the Kremlin weaken America and our institutions um, and, and try to turn us against each other, try to pull us more to extremes, and turn us against each other. So I think that's point one. Point two, which is related with some of the European examples that we saw here, is dividing the US from Europe, weakening NATO, weakening the EU. Um, these are themes that we've seen played out again and again across Europe, um, which again, I think we see in the messaging here. Um, and then, you know, number three is that they will sort of exploit whatever they can um, in order to be able to get Americans' attention. And I think especially emotional issues um, in, in our political discourse are ones that are particularly vulnerable. Um, and that's really tricky because these are real issues in the United States, right? Like racism, immigration debates, um, you know, questions of our criminal justice system. Um, you know, these are, are real issues that are, um, important to have authentic debates about. The, the, the key part of that is having authentic de debates that aren't being manipulated um, covertly from, from foreign hands, um, you know, thousands of miles away. So easy question, what do we do about it? Um, I'm gonna give a couple of sort of the top line points on this um, and then, you know, would love to hear um, some of your ideas and thoughts as well. The first is, um, I think we need to do a lot of work to be learning from each other, um, learning from other democracies. Um, as I mentioned earlier, thinking about the European examples of how they have um, been countering some of this, what's been effective, um, and, and really try to understand um, how do we better defend ourselves and how do we deter this activity, right? So the defensive piece of that is a lot of closing off our own vulnerabilities. Um, that's both in the, you know, in the social um, space of, of healing these long-term divisions, um, reducing partisanship. Um, I truly believe these are really important national security issues at this point because they are being exploited um, to try to, to hurt us. Um, but that also means understanding um, how we um, can address vulnerabilities um, in our in our election systems. Um, so again, going back to the other dimension of this, the hacking and all of that, um, taking real steps to better secure our ele election infrastructure, strengthening our media environment. Um, these are all really important defensive steps. Um, uh, there's a deterrent aspect of this as well, which has to be about how do we raise the costs on this kind of behavior. Um, you know, I think actually this is where our Congress has done some good work in putting forward some um, sanctions um, that the Trump administration has now taken some steps to implement, um, including um, uh, putting some, some sanctions and designations on uh, oligarchs that are closely connected to Putin. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of Putin's goals here is maintaining his own power. Um, part of that for him is uh, his money. Um, big part of that is his money. Um, by the way, most of that money is money he stole from the Russian people as well. Um, and so thinking about, you know, how do we, this challenge of how do we um, defend our democracy without um, closing off our free speech, without shutting ourselves down in a way um, that actually would sort of play into the hands of those trying to weaken us, um, is how do we think about our own advantages here? And one of that is, is you know, being able to, to really go after um, some of the financial assets that, that Putin and his cronies who work to carry this out care so much about. Um, I think another piece of this um, has to be about building resiliency at home. Um, and so as, as Jamie talked about earlier, how do we, how do we inoculate ourselves to be um, less, less susceptible to, to this kind of activity? Um, that also means um, taking steps um, to address our social media um, vulnerabilities. We've seen very clearly that, again, these forces that um, have been in some ways in, you know, a democratizing force, right? So in the context of the Arab Spring, many of us were talking about the power of social media. Um, and I still think that in um, authoritarian states, um, these can be very powerful tools for 
um, democracy activists, human rights activists, to be able to organize. Um, but the, the critical piece there is how do we maximize um, that benefit and how do we um, minimize the, the downside risk? And I don't think um, there's been enough uh, of that work to date um, coming out of Silicon Valley. I think they have had some wake-up calls, um, and I think that that is underway, um, but that's something that Jamie and I have been having a lot of conversations with them about. Um, looking ahead, so not just fighting the battle of yesterday, um, but understanding the, the future threats. Um, again, one of the things I think that, that we are um, so deeply worried about is um, how new technology will allow for the manipulation of video and audio content. Um, these have been called deep fakes um, in many cases, if any of you have been following this. Um, so that you, the people have actually um, produced these now, um, you know, video content of President Obama or President Trump or whomever, um, saying things that they actually never said, but in a way that is undetectable to the human eye. Um, and if we think about um, how difficult it's been to manage some of the more conspiratorial um, you know, news stories that have circulated, um, video content moves even more quickly on, uh, on social media. Um, and we as humans, I think, are just sort of, sort of trained um, to accept what we see um, in video. It, it feels real to us. Um, and so that's going to be even more difficult to figure out how we, um, how we address that going forward. Um, and then the last point I would just say is, you know, I think we need to really remember that at the end of the day, as, as difficult as these challenges are, our democracies have real advantages. Um, and we need to make sure that we are building on those advantages um, and we are um, fortifying the institutions um, in a way that will better protect us against these attacks in the first place. So with that, I think, um, Time for questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We have time for some questions now for our in-person audience. If you have a question, please turn your table tent on its side and a member of our staff will bring a microphone to you. For our live stream audience, you can ask questions via chi.cnf.io. Yes, Mr. Whitehead, please. This has been fascinating. Thank you. And I have so many questions, particularly about all the things that you're doing, which were news to me. But you said something at the very beginning, and this may seem like a really dumb question, but uh, you mentioned Putin's motivation. And frankly, lately I've been thinking about that. Russia is not an expansionist country. It has very few natural resources that are worth anything. It is rampant with crime and controlled by criminal elements. <clears throat> quite unlike China and quite unlike other countries, even though China is not an, an expansionist country, it has designs on, on influencing other countries. Russia doesn't. What, I mean, we know Putin's blackmailing Trump because he's threatening to withdraw his loans, and so we, we know we have a puppet in the, in the White House. But what is Putin's goals? I, I, I know weakening democracy. I agree with your three goals. But <laughs> why? If he really wants to build up his country, why doesn't he try to mend fences with the West and get investment and get things that would enrich his country? Is it solely this Russian thing that we got to be big and beat our chest because the world has beaten us down for so long? I, I just don't get his motivation. He could seemingly do so much more for his country with a totally different approach toward the West. And I know that seems dumb no, after all the Cold no, no, War no, no, years. But no, I remember good. we went to Russia right after Perestroika, and my biggest impression, this is a, a Potemkin village. Mm -hmm. It was a fraud. Russia was a fraud. They, didn't, they couldn't saw, I mean, their model houses, you wouldn't, you wouldn't let your dog live in them. I mean, their industrial park was a joke. And I think Putin knows that. So, what is he doing? Why is he doing this? I, I don't get it. So uh, I totally agree with your assessment of sort of the, the Russian, um, the landscape uh, there and the sort of rampant criminal empire that is essentially Russia uh, today. What I would say is sort of two points and then I invite Jamie to jump in. The, the first is I don't think Putin cares about building up Russia. I think Putin cares about building up Putin. Um, and so Putin doesn't have a broader interest in helping Russia. All he really cares about is his own power and his own wealth. Um, and, and so I think that creates a different landscape. And then related to that is something Jamie and I have spoken a lot about is 
Therefore, Putin has an interest in discrediting democracy at home. Um, if he can prove to his people, if he can show, look at that chaos happening in America, in Europe, where they have democracy and they're voting and it's a mess and their government can't deliver for their people, I'm delivering for you. I'm, I'm strong, I'm able to, to hold our government together, hold our country together. Um, I think that that actually plays to Putin's advantage to be able to discredit democracy in other countries. That, that's my, that is my view. I think, I, I think where things currently stand, that's, that's what we're dealing with. I think, though, you do have to realize that Putin has always had these, these aspirations to return Russia to the, the situation it, it was in during the height of the Soviet Union when he was a, a kid and moving up then through the ranks where Russia was essentially a superpower. And as Russian power has declined, obviously that's something that Putin does not accept. And so a lot of this is driven by that. I do think now, especially as we get towards the likely end of his tenure, it's much more base instincts of maintaining his grip on power, protecting his personal wealth at this point. And these sorts of activities, both in Europe and the US, are very good images for him to project back to his own populace because it shows how disorganized and chaotic d democracy is. Why would you want to aspire to something like that? Uh, and so there are multiple reasons. Um, I will say one final point. Putin, the interesting thing is Putin, like I said earlier, was given the opportunity by multiple administrations to have that sort of path towards cooperation. In the post 9-11 era with President Bush, it was all about working together on counterterrorism and arms control, but he felt threatened by the color revolutions and saw the hand of the US behind him uh, and uh, felt that somehow the US was trying to overthrow him. And so that then led to the way he handled Georgia. And in the Obama years, uh, we saw with Medvedev's uh, ascension to the presidency, this hope again that this was a modern, new type of leader. Remember the iPad carrying Medvedev who listens to rock music and I think on one of his first visits to the US, uh, he was taken by the Obama administration to Silicon Valley because he wanted to replicate Silicon Valley in Russia. And so Russia at various points in the last several decades had these opportunities to engage US administrations, but Putin at the end of the day, I think wasn't interested in that path of cooperation. Take a question from our online audience. What steps can the average US citizen take to help counter this issue? The one thing I'll just highlight uh, is, as Laura outlined all the different recommendations in the areas, um, we do think this is a whole of society problem. Uh, the government cannot solve this. The tech companies cannot solve this alone. And uh, we're never gonna eliminate the threat entirely, even if we impose uh, a deterrent cost on actors that try to influence us from abroad, at the end of the day, I think it's incumbent upon uh, the American citizens to be smarter consumers of news and information, more active participants in their democracy. A lot of the social media examples I showed you, they don't work if you have a social media consumer who asks questions and thinks through, well, who is this account? Why am I listening to a random account that I don't even know who is behind it? Uh, Representative Will Hurd from Texas, who's a Republican, a former CIA agent, spoke at an event at GMF, and he coined the term which we liked, the new stranger danger. You know, we teach our kids to not get in the vehicles of strangers, to not talk to strangers in public places, so why aren't we teaching our kids that they should be more careful about the strangers they engage with online? Which is the real problem, honestly, of how many Americans are so, uh, have, have such a sense of dislocation. They're not actually talking to their neighbors or people in their community about politics. They're going online and talking to strangers. <laughs> and it opens up uh, a lot of opportunity for manipulation, not just by the Russians or other foreign actors, but people with an agenda, whether it's companies or wealthy individuals who are trying to push a certain message to a broad segment of the populace. So I think the more that people are educated and careful consumers, especially of information on social media, that would be one big first step that, could, that people could take. Ms. Eshelman, please. And a microphone's on its way. Um, yeah, again, thank you very much for being here today. It's great, great information. What's your organization's um, perspective and work on internal efforts to disrupt democracy? And if you think about you know, Citizens United, the NRA, um, you know, voter suppression, things like that. So 
Jamie and I are national security experts. We come at this from the foreign policy perspective. And so we haven't, our work isn't focused on sort of how we address those issues. Um, we leave that to our colleagues who are better versed in domestic policy. Um, but we do, as Jamie laid out, you know, the vulnerabilities um, that are being exploited. Um, we do see, um, you know, in things like some of our, our campaign finance infrastructure that allows for, Jamie may jump in here with a diff different point, um, but, you know, there, there are vulnerabilities in our campaign finance infrastructure, for instance, um, with dark money um, that can be exploited then by foreign actors. Um, so one area um, where we have been engaged is um, a piece of legislation that's in, sitting on the Hill right now called the Honest Ads Act, um, which would, you know, right now, if you purchase um, a, a political advertisement on television or radio or the newspaper, there are certain disclosure requirements that come along with that. There are certain transparency requirements. Um, if you purchase a political advertisement on social media, um, right now anybody can do that. Um, you can, uh, what we now know is the Russians just, they, they actually paid in rubles um, for, for their um, advertising on Facebook. Um, you don't have to sort of disclose um, the, the donors behind that. You also don't have to, um, one of the things that is um, particularly difficult about the social media environment is you can micro-target um, you know, to specific audiences. And so in terms of transparency, like right now any ad that runs on television, a campaign will be able to know, you know, the opposing campaign or, you know, I'm talking in the campaign context here, but, you know, would know what ad is being run against them. And if something is being said that's untruthful or that they believe is incorrect, they can mount a counter argument and the media can fact check that. Right now we essentially have dark ads that are running on social media where, you know, people you know, campaigns don't see them, the media can't see them, the fact check. So the Honest Ads Act is sort of one piece of legislation that we think, again, is is taking on a, a small piece of that vulnerability um, that we have in our democratic um, infrastructure. Um, but I also think, you know, that there are absolutely forces um, internally, and we see the same thing in the European context where um, the Russian effort has basically tried to prompt more extremist forces in societies, um, build them up, and then essentially use them as, as proxies. Um, and I, I worry about um, heading in that direction here in the United States. And do you want to jump in? Mr. Kazimidis, please. Uh, Jimmy, Laura, thank you guys for taking the time to speak with us today. It's been really interesting. Um, you guys did mention about how in the U.S. Um, there's kind of a lack of faith in terms of the voting uh, institutions as well as people's distrust of the government and the agencies. Um, what do you guys think, I guess, we as Americans and just the government can do to help kind of reinvigorate that trust? I mean, uh, it first starts with political leadership. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think in the, in the 2016 case, you, you had um, then-candidate Trump kind of contributing to that uncertainty and questioning of the legitimacy of the election. So I think that's the worst case scenario when you have one of the participants in the campaign kind of casting doubt because then obviously, and I think this is, if you look at the intelligence community assessments, uh, the obviously the Russians I think did not believe that Donald Trump was gonna win the election. They assumed that Secretary Clinton was gonna win and actually a lot of this was about laying the groundwork to disrupt the early months of her presidency and cast doubt on whether she was the legitimate victor. Uh, and so the last thing you wanted one side questioning that. So I think, actually think we need more politicians to speak out in defense of the system to encourage people to participate, uh, to state clearly that the system is not rigged. Um, over the long run, uh, we haven't really talked that much about, I mean, I mentioned individuals becoming informed consumers. We're increasingly looking at things like media literacy and civics education. Uh, and uh, trying again to learn from some of the European experiences. There are a number of European countries that are starting to do uh, a, a certain type of push, a certain type of curriculum related to media literacy at very young ages to teach people how to become conform, uh, cons uh, informed consumers of news and information, especially on social media. I think that's something uh, we should try on a, a pilot level here in the US. I may not always uh, translate in the same way, obviously, in terms of what you teach, but part of that also is just uh, making sure that civics education is being 
uh, taught because it's something that has to be built up uh, over time. I'll just add one other point to this, which is a very sort of broad one, but um, Jamie and I are doing this as a bipartisan effort because we believe that the only way to actually combat this is from a bipartisan perspective. So much of this effort um, to undermine our democracy is based on trying to divide us from each other. And what we've seen as well in sort of, especially in the congressional space, but it sort of carries across all branches of government, um, is an inability to work on a bipartisan basis has led to um, a, a, a failure of, of governance in, in many cases, right? And so you see people losing faith in institutions, um, not just the voting system, but I mean, it relates because if you don't think government's working, you may be less likely to vote in the first place. Um, and so I do believe that it is of like absolute strategic importance um, to be able to work on a bipartisan basis um, to shore up the foundations of our democracy and make government work because the reality is that a failure to do so is being used to weaken our country. We have about five minutes remaining, so time for one more question. Ms. Napo, please. I think it's very helpful that you've uh, provided all of this information that's been a um, topic of discussion. I'm just curious though, um, have organizations such, well, it takes some effort though to find this information on the individual's part to seek out what is true and to, to decipher these facts. Have organizations such as yours ever cons considered using the openness of our internet to push the message, to push the dialogue and to begin having these needed conversations uh, amongst the broader community and start engaging people? We're hoping uh, partly through the tool uh, that you can, the, the dashboard that I highlighted, the social media dashboard, uh, which is at securingdemocracy.gmfus.org. Anyone can go on at any moment and look at what's, what's currently, securingdemocracy.gmfus.org, gmfus.org. Uh, um, so any person on, can go online and look at like what the messages are that are being pushed in any given moment. We've had all our publications up there that have some of these summaries. We're hoping to develop other tools like that, uh, not just on the social media uh, toolkit that is being used, but also in the financial influence space, uh, a mapping project to look at all the different examples in European countries of this sort of influence. So we are using social media in that respect. Um, now there is, a, I guess, a debate that some have that we should basically turn the tables and use the same tactics uh, to push back. Um, I think Laura and I are a little bit more skeptical of that approach because um, quite frankly, we think some of what the Russians did exposed vulnerabilities in the way many of the social media platforms operate that we would rather have the social media platforms shut down those vulnerabilities and close them rather than exacerbate them by manipulating people through social media further, uh, even though it would be for uh, good purposes, uh, ideally, but um, there are some people who are, are arguing those sorts of things. You also hear the same thing about, from a deterrent perspective, well, we need to manipulate uh, the vote that Putin was having and make sure he gets less of a percentage of the Russian popular vote than he wanted. Um, you know, we strongly believe in U.S. democracy uh, programming, but we believe that fundamentally what the U.S. government does, uh, at least uh, now, is different than what the Russians are doing. The U.S. government provides basic uh, education, training of political activists. They, the U.S. government offers that to all comers. Any political party that wants to get U.S. assistance uh, can. Uh, the U.S. does not go in and try to manipulate what happens in a particular district in a Russian voting booth uh, or a precinct. Um, so anyways, we do believe that we, we shouldn't necessarily take all of the tactics that are being used against us and turn them around against Russia or another potential actor. Yeah, let me just um, add two points to that. The, the first is to go back to something that Jamie mentioned earlier, which is that um, we believe exposure and sunlight is one of the most important ways to address this challenge. Um, and so as we go forward in our work, we launched our program in July of last year. So um, we're, we're still sort of building um, on some of our early work, but we are looking to do um, more uh, of our own outreach. We have an um, advisory council of former senior national security officials from um, both parties um, uh, as well. 
um, and really hoping to do some more work to get people out to different parts of the country um, for these conversations, um, number one, and, and working with um, ideally some, some local partners, again, on sort of the bipartisan basis. Um, I mean, I think empowered consumers of information, empowered voters, I mean, those are both really important critical pieces of any democracy to function, period, um, especially when that's a democracy under threat. Um, and so I think that the more we can do, um, as Jamie said as well, with um, putting some of these tools online, um, we do a lot of work with, um, with traditional media as well, trying to help them um, understand and talk about these issues in a way that will help better inform the debate. The one thing I think Jamie and I have both been troubled by is the occasional um, use of some of the issues we just talked about here for sort of partisan purposes or to kind of hype up um, some of the threat in a way that we worry actually um, is, is counterproductive to addressing the challenge itself. So we also spend a lot of time um, with reporters and journalists um, and, and producers trying to help them understand what is the real nature of the challenge, um, what is it not, and how, how to best um, articulate in a way that, that makes sense to, to you know, American consumers of information. Thank you for joining us for today's program. Now please join me in thanking Jamie Fly and Laura Rosenberger. Thank you.